So hello friends. So I had this uh, debate in national conference in Kochi. Uh, so the debate was on seventh, uh, and I was asked to debate against the notion that all patients in shock needs invasive hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, so my debater who would say that all patients in shock need hemodynamic monitoring was Rahul Pandit and uh, the, the middle path uh, would be Subhash Todi who would uh, give a balanced view sort of a thing. So as I put in, it's a con debate because uh, so the previous speaker would have spoken has basically tried to con the audience saying that everyone needs uh, hemodynamic monitoring. So, so the word here which we need to pay attention is all. So that all is what I'm going to refute, that all patients in shock do not need invasive hemodynamic monitoring. So the agenda that I will try to argue my point is look into the background. And uh, so if you have a choice between invasive IHM, I'll be using it. It's invasive hemodynamic monitoring or non-invasive. So if I ask anyone, so I think the common sense prevails that we have to go non-invasive. And most importantly, we are all evidence-based uh, pundits. So we have to look whether there is evidence at all to say that putting catheters, being invasive, really saves lives uh, or there is an alternative for that. So we need to look. So we have to be guided by what is available evidence. And, and anything that is invasive, friends, you know, the whole world is invasive today and you are seeing the whole complications of it. And every invasive procedure we know comes with its own set of complications. So we need to understand all the nuances with complications that we have to deal with when you're talking about invasive and more so in a critically unwell patients. And now the holy grail is, do we have perfect solutions? So I need to tell you that we do have a perfect solution uh, not by not going invasive. And then we'll talk about conclusion and then the rebuttal if time permits, because this talk is meant to be only eight minutes. So if I have time that I would do a rebuttal. So this came in 2022, so if you see, the authors here, each one is a join in intensive care, and they have put, put a desperate plea to the intensive care community for personalization of hemodynamic management and don't go by some sacrosanct sort of a approach saying that everyone needs invasive hemodynamics. So there was a plea, there was a desperate plea by all the legends of intensive care as you see in this. So when you talk about invasive hemodynamic monitoring for all the audience, so that comes to our mind in ICU, is all these three modalities. So arterial line, CBC catheters we know is obsolete pretty much with regards to as a monitoring tool. Obviously we use CVCs for infusions and then cardiac output monitors and PA catheters. So these are the three main sort of an invasive tools that we have and we have to argue over routine usage of these. And my argument is not all shock patients need these tools to be put in place. So this is our argument. So now the question is, we have non-invasive tools. And if you look at the sepsis guidelines, all types of shock needs an upfront assessment by echocardiogram. And echocardiography, which is a non-invasive tool, pretty much gives you the characterization of the type of shock that you may be dealing with. And we know invasive hemodynamic monitoring are invasive and they come with cost. And along with the cost, you need to have a manpower expertise and logistic issue and nurses have to be trained in dealing with these invasive tools and mo clinical monitoring plus non-invasive hemodynamic is found to be superior as opposed to invasive hemodynamic and goes a long way in saving lives and echocardiogram which is the which is now the point of care ultrasound which is pretty much a standard of care in all icu gives an accurate bedside assessment of your heart function and it does give you a functional assessment of uh, the cardiac function and the hemodynamic status. And then most importantly, all the tools that you talk about, arterial line, CVC, they do not give sort of a structural assessment of what the problem may be. And echocardiogram is one point tool or a one-stop solution which gives you assessment, functional, hemodynamic assessment and structural aspects that may be problem in any hemodynamically unstable patient. And when we look at the evidence, when you look into the core element, what we believe in, there is no evidence for invasive hemodynamic monitoring. So I'll show you some of the studies. So this was a study that came in 2015, which is a retrospective data for arterial line, which showed, in fact, there's no improvement in mortality. In fact, it increased. Patients who had 
arterial lines, their length of stay was much higher. And this was a propensity match cohort analysis, which was part of the project impact study in mechanically ventilated patients uh, published by US authors in 2014. We showed there's no benefit of routine arterial line placement in shock patients. And there are other downsides to arterial line because the waveform determines your hemodynamic status. So if you have something waveform like this, which is a hyper resonant node, it overestimates blood pressure in a patient who otherwise may have low blood pressure, or it may be over dampened form where blood pressure may be normal and it may underrepresent the blood pressure. So these are some of the caveats which a clinician should be aware of. So there are certain technical nuances which can be misinterpreted when you are using these lines. And even the arterial line trace is different at different sites. If you look at aorta and radial artery, uh, the pressures are very variable. And this was a study which was published by Australian authors where it showed that if arterial line is placed in femoral artery, 63% of the time the readings are overestimated are much higher than other. And if you see the uh, sort of illustrative example, the blood pressures are very different in brachial artery, radial artery, and femoral artery, and femoral artery always overestimates. So it means the site where you put the artery and the characterization of the arteries that are present also sort of a, a reflective of the hemodynamic status, which could be overestimated or underestimated. So the Garland et al. have suggested that more rigorous control trials are needed to subscribe to the fact that all hemodynamically unstable patients need arterial line and routine use of arterial line is limited to expert opinion and there is no evidence-based, substantial evidence-based medicine for it. And it is maybe, maybe perhaps justifiable in very, very unwell patients who have not stabilized after your initial resuscitation and there is a cascading need of vasopressors or where in, in a complex shock situation where you need monitoring cardiac output or drawing of the blood, sampling of the blood becomes easy by having this. So these are some of, so that's why my argument is not all, all patients do not need, but there are some subgroup of patients, there are cohort of patients with needs. I'm not telling all shock patients need it. Some shock patients definitely may need this is my argument. And now let us look into, so we spoke about arterial life, there's no evidence. So we'll talk about PA catheters or cardiac output. So there is an escape trial which came in heart failure where they looked at cardiac output assessment by putting thermodilution techniques and pulmonary artery catheters, which came in JAMA. There was no improvement in survival and there was no reduction in the hospital length of stay in this escape trial. And there was a Cochrane review in 2013 with the use of pulmonary artery catheter, which became very popular in our intensive care community. We showed no significant reduction in mortality and there was no significant reduction in ICU and hospital length of stay. So if you look at overall evidence for PA catheter, we know it has faded. Escape trial shows that and meta-analysis did show there is no benefit. And in fact, after this, there was a obituary that came, pulmonary artery catheter, they, they, they put up an uh, article as an obituary from 1972-2013, which came in Annals of Intensive Care by Merrick et al. So it means they put a uh, full stop to the usage of pulmonary artery catheter. So, and if you look at the summarily, all the other cardiac output that are there and limitations, so thermo pulmonary thermodilution, there is no continuous measure, although it is claimed that it will give continuous measure of cardiac output, you have to do cold injected to get the cardiac output rate. So it is a myth and a misnomer that people say that it gives continuous measure. It doesn't give continuous measurement and nurse have to be trained and they have to do in a sequential way to get the cardiac output rate. And the pulse contour analysis needs regular calibration to have an accurate reading and interpretation of the cardiac output. And all the PICO monitors, global and diastolic does not give you the measure of the Cardiac output, even if it is low cardiac output, doesn't say whether low cardiac output is from LV or from the RV. It does not delineate that. And quantification of pulmonary edema and not necessarily is well reflected. Stroke volume variation is not reliable. We all understand in spontaneously breathing patients, most of our patients are spontaneously breathing and in patients with arrhythmia. And most of our patients have severe ARDS and stroke volume variation is unreliable. And extravascular lung water can be unreliable, especially if you have ventilation perfusion mismatch due to pulmonary thromboembolism, or it can be overestimated in patients with lung resection or in pleural So these are, there are a lot of periods 
for any of these hemodynamic monitoring and none of them are sacrosanct in giving a correct estimate of what the underlying problem may be. So, the, so friends, you saw the evidence. There's absolutely no robust evidence for arterial lines, PA catheter, and all the other cardiac output monitors that are available. What about complications? All three are fraught with complications and all the observational data shows that the risk of complications outweighs any benefits that any of these tools confer to our patients. And when you look at the complications, we see arterial line, how many patients we see in our ICU who have a digital ischemia and there is pseudo aneurysms caused because of your erratic insertion of arterial line for everyone and hemorrhage at the arterial line side. So these are all the common complications. And if you're talking about cardiac output, CVC or pulmonary artery catheter, there's a whole lot of complications. It's there can injury to the nerves, injury to the major vessels, injury to the airway, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and chylothorax. All these are complications well, well referenced with any of these procedures. Even with ultrasound, you can cause injury to all these sort of structures and which have their own morbidity and contribute to the mortality. Now, the question is, do we have perfect solution? Yes, we do have perfect solution. Individualized approach is more effective and routine bedside clinical examination, clinical acumen, along with lab indicators are a good reflectors of fluid responsiveness. And I'm going to show some Buchakra, which I think is the ideal way that we assess the fluid responsiveness. Look at the heart rate. You do some intervention. If heart rate is coming down, blood pressure is improving. Look at the urine output. Look at improvement in acidosis. Look at reduction in lactate. In dengue, you don't need arterial lines. We see for the correction of hematocrit, whether hematocrit is coming down. Look at these and look at the entitled CO2 if they have. Mixed venous, anyway, I won't talk. Improved sensorium. If someone has come up tendered, you are resuscitated. If there is sensorium, is improving. You know cardiac output has improved. Patient is getting better. And look at the peripheries. And look at the bun. Bun is a good indicator in patients like pancreas. So everything has to be individualized. Like HCT, hematocrit, I look in. Dengue, bun, I look in. Pancreatitis. And lactate, I look in sepsis and improvement in urine output and improvement in sensorium, I look in cardiogenic shock and look at liver and liver enzymes in dengue. We look at liver enzymes, improvement in liver enzymes is optimization of resuscitation. And of course, we also need to look at whether there is raised JDP or whether there's pedal edema or crackle. So these clinical tools are better indicators for me to ascertain the sort of responsiveness of the uh, assessment of shock. And even this is a study from Canada, which has very clearly shown ultrasound usage has shown guided resuscitation, has shown reduction in 28-day mortality and lowered the need for excessive fluid resuscitation and lowered the need for RRT. And this study from US also shown ultrasounded guided therapy showed optimization of fluid and correction and it guided and helped the decision making much better with 50% changes in their clinical decision making with ultrasound. And this was a study from Brazil which showed just assessing B lines will help us to ascertain whether a patient is in a fluid tolerant state or fluid intolerant state. So these are the solutions. These are the perfect solutions that I have and I don't need to depend on invasive tools to assess it. So the conclusion is current evidence suggests that invasive hemodynamic monitoring is not needed in all shock patients. And Clinical acumen, I'm a clinician, I'm a physician, clinical acumen, clinical monitoring with non-invasive, use echocardiogram, point of care ultrasound to look at the structural pattern, functional pattern, fluid responsiveness is absolutely safe and effective and selective patients with a specific approach has to be utilized to guide the use of invasive. So this is, this is my conclusions at the end of it. And I would say invasives are dangerous. Today, the whole world is struggling because people are getting more invasive. We have to get non-invasive and we have to advocate non-invasive in our approach, minimally invasive. And of course, I say there is a select group of patients who benefit from this and we cannot have a blanket statement saying every shock patients need sort of an invasive procedure. And I would say to my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Pandit, who is arguing, this is a beautiful quote every intensivist should uh, remember. Laplace, he discovered oxygen, but he failed to call oxygen. He called it as deep phlogisticated air. That's what he called. And he said this statement, the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim, my colleague is making, extraordinary claim he's making that all shock patients need uh, invasive monitoring must be proportioned to its strangeness. I feel it's very strange. He's arguing that all patients need 
uh, invasive monitoring. What we know is not much. What we do not know is immense. So this is what was told by Laplace, who actually discovered oxygen, but he didn't call it oxygen. He called it as deep logisticated air. So that's my argument. So the rebuttal, if I have time, so I would just show two studies in rebuttal, which substantiates uh, the most recent evidence which has come in, which tells us that ultrasound guided sort of a resuscitation has a better bearing. And this came in the American Heart Channel, Cable Ultrasound Heart Failure Study, where they used in heart failure monitoring of IVC. This was a single center randomized control trial. They did daily quantitative eight zone method. They looked at uh, a primary endpoint as patients having more than five B lines or, I, or increase in IVC diameter. Secondary endpoint, they looked at death at 90 days and worsening of heart failure due to readmission. And they found the 30 patients who were randomized to the cable ultrasound, primary endpoint, as you see, uh, which is the B lines less than five and non plethoric IVC was significantly less in, in the ultrasound group. And secondary endpoint, which is 28 day mortality, was significantly less in the cable ultrasound and even pro BNP reduction was much better in the ultrasound group and safety was similar. So the conclusion they made in this study was IVC and lung ultrasound guided treatment in acute heart failure. Acute heart failure means they are decompensated, significantly reduced supplement congestion and discharge. And this another trial came in 2024, Korean study, where they used sort of a not fully invasive, I can pretty much say this non-invasive thoracic bioimpedance, looking at the extracellular water and total body water ratio. They looked at post-surgical patient where the volume resuscitated based on this uh, impedance assay and they de-resuscitated the patients and they maintained these patients with a uh, ECW, extracellular water and total body water ratio of 0.39 to 0.406, which was considered as U-volumic. And primary outcome was to look at hospital mortality and secondary outcome was to look at post-surgical complications, 28-day mortality. And in this study also, they showed the thoracic bioimpedance Hospital mortality showed signal towards reduction, although it did not attain statistical significance, but 28-day mortality was significantly less by using non-invasive tools. And uh, they saw that by in patients who had a higher extracellular water by total body water uh, have, was an independent predictor of post-operative complications. So the conclusions they made was by using non-invasive tools like thoracic bioimpedance, Although it did not reduce hospital mortality, it did reduce 28-day mortality. So this is my rebuttal. If I get a time, I would have spoken about these two latest studies, which emphasizes on the use of ultrasound and bioimpedance assay as a tools which can help us reduce deaths and not the invasive monitoring. So thank you one and all. So I request you all to submit your valuable work to a Journal of Acute Care. Of course, you can visit my website to rehear to this lecture. So thank you. Thank you one and all.